In the heart of Paris, in the Saint-Germain-des-Prés neighborhood, the fine arts school. Throughout the 19th century, the Paris Fine Arts School represented the last word in the teaching of art in Europe. A school designed like a series of Chinese boxes containing the history of architecture, where each section of wall is merely a fragment that has to be deciphered like a rebus. From the Rue Bonaparte to the Quai Malaquais, the school now occupies two hectares of land acquired during the course of its expansion, as in every city centre where space is rare and expensive. For orientation purposes, the administration today refers to five groups of buildings. The Mulberry Court, the Loggia Building, the Palais des Etudes, the Perret Building, and the Hotel de Chimay. This group of buildings from different periods forms a genuine town within the city. Even so, one building stands out, the Palais des Etudes, the most important among them for many years, located directly opposite the only entrance on Rue Bonaparte. The school, as conceived in the last century, has ceased to exist since May 1968. Architecture is no longer taught here, and only the plastic arts remain, along with multimedia. Today, the approach to art and its teaching has nothing to do with that of the past. Drawing, copying from ancient pieces or old masters. For centuries, this was the basis of the teaching of fine arts as devised by the academy, which had gathered models, architectural fragments, and copies of Renaissance masterpieces for that very purpose. A sort of museum, but with a difference. This vast collection had no permanent home. In 1816, the Restoration government decided to give a home to the Fine Arts Institute that formerly had no fixed abode. The site granted to the new school lay across the Seine from the Louvre, which had previously housed the artists for many years. The land was already occupied by an old development from the 17th century, a church, a large cloister, a smaller cloister, and various houses on the street sides. This wasn't an innocent choice. It was the site of a former convent that during the revolution had become the scene of a unique undertaking that left a lasting mark on the imagination of the times. This was the Museum of French Monuments, founded by Alexandre Lenoir, that gathered fragments of sculpture and architecture saved from the chateau and churches destroyed by the revolutionaries, a byproduct of the revolutionary vandalism that for the first time brought examples of the history of French art together in a public collection, arousing the enthusiasm of the Romantics from Victor Hugo to Michelet. But the returning monarchy decided to dismantle the Revolutionary Museum and gave the premises to the new Fine Arts School. The first architect hired to convert the premises, François Debray, simply used the garden at the far end of the plot where he planned the installation of two new buildings. A building on one side and a monumental building on virtually all the rest of the land. A young student, Félix Dubon, was associated with the work from its launch as deputy inspector. But Dubon was awarded the Prix de Rome in 1823 and set off for a five-year stay at the Villa Médicis. The Prix de Rome was the school's most prestigious award, a single student chosen each year in each discipline to whom the Academy offered a five-year stay in Rome and, above all, the guarantee of an official career on his return. The architects had to carry out the archaeological survey of a ruin and imagine what the building would have looked like in its heyday. Dubon picked the Octavian Portico as his subject, a collection of sparse ruins in the Rome ghetto. 
This wasn't by chance. The Octavian ruins are those of a school, a scuola, in the ancient meaning of the word. In other words, an intellectual center that includes two temples, a library, and schools. Dubon noted that the temples were similar to museums, containing masterpieces from ancient Greece. Shortly after his return from Rome, Dubon was named as the architect to the Fine Arts School, thanks to the 1830 revolution. The new regime wished to fall into line with the mood of the times, Romanticism, and Dubon was picked out for his support of the Romantic literary movement. The authorities were counting on him to give a new lease of life to a project that had hardly made any headway in 13 years. Dubon, who had reconstructed the plans of the Octavian Portico, would take his inspiration from them to design his own plan for the Fine Arts School. It wasn't an easy task. Dubon inherited a complete layout and unfinished buildings on a plot of land trapped in the city and without street access. He decided to clear the area in front of the palace obstructed by the older buildings. He demolished the small cloister, made a compulsory purchase order on the houses along the street, and, to clear the way for the palace, moved back the alignment of the large cloister that he rebuilt in his own manner. Having clarified the space in this manner, Dubon reorganized the distribution of the school's buildings and assigned three distinct functions to the three buildings on the site. The cloister at the entrance would be used for classes and for different services and stores. The building at the rear, known as the Loggia building, would be used solely for exams. And the main building, thus freed of all trivial functions, would become the study museum that could house the collections, a library, and a hall for prize giving. Debray had designed a palace. Dubon retained its outline but transformed the facade. Dubon had several loves. Rome, but also Florence, a city that he had discovered during his travels in Italy and whose old palaces he greatly admired. The facade of the study museum is a copy of the Florentine palaces with their rustic stonework, exposed stone, and large arched windows. Orders lend rhythm to the facade on its upper floors. Inside, the study museum also has the structure of a Florentine palace with open galleries overlooking a large courtyard. Originally, the courtyard was open to the sky. But with the growth of the collections, Dubon had to use the courtyard area by covering it with a large glass canopy. He made the most of this new area to supplement the models on offer to the students, with full-scale models of the columns of the Parthenon and those of the Temple of Jupiter Stator in Rome. These columns were so tall, 22 meters, that a trap door had to be led into the ground to accommodate them. The trap door is still there, but the casts of ancient works were shattered in May 1968 and have been removed. By displaying these models that have now vanished, Dubon wanted to make copying a spiritual experience, as if he wanted to urge his students on, according to his biographer, and tell them, Believe me, you young architects who form the majority at the Fine Arts School, you will one day use painters and sculptors. You will exert on them the influence that every creator exerts on those with whom he chooses to work. 
Return to simplicity and grandeur. Here is the secret of proportion in great art. Do not copy them, but let these examples be a constant reminder of the laws that must govern us. Instead of copying the work of others, create. Become natural writers of this fine universal language called architecture. Dubon didn't stop at exposing models within these walls. The walls, too, became a museum. On the ceiling of the first floor galleries, the teachers of painting at the school requested copies of the Vatican Loges. Dubon seized this opportunity to go even further and refurbish the whole gallery. In order to reconstruct a little of the grandeur of the Vatican lodges that extend over 13 arches, Dubon copied Raphael's decoration for the walls. Since he didn't have windows or the means of using stucco, he opted for a trompe l'oeil decor in tempera, known for its resistance. In this way, recounts his biographer, he offered a thousand students in Paris the joys that only the successors of Pope Leo X could feel each day on passing through such a gallery. On the stairways of the building, Dubon exposed all the available materials and the different ways of decorating a wall. This brought him harsh criticism. The main staircase is merely a sample card. All these marble slabs recessed into the walls have barely more value in the eyes of a man of taste than Harlequin's costume. Monsieur Dubon's work lacks unity. The builder of the fine arts school has never created anything. For him, inventing and remembering are the same thing. However, in this eclecticism, the critics didn't perceive an attempt to bring the countless elements together in order to fire the student's imagination. At the top of the wall, another reference. The panels recall the baptistry in Florence. In the courtyard, Dubon redesigned the whole space to create one enormous history lesson. To open up the facade of his building trapped at the back of the yard, Dubon drew two half-circle excedra that form a forecourt to the palace. another recollection of the Octavian schools. Behind the temples, noted Durban, one found the excedra-shaped square. The idea that the ancients gave to the word school, scuola, in other words, a place for rest and philosophical dissertation, made me decide to surround it with a raised enclosure that guarantees the contemplation required by the place. Indeed, the main courtyard was enclosed within the past, and the excedra are simply an extension of an object of which only traces remain today. Between the courts, there was a portico called the Arc de Gaillon, named after the chateau of the first French Renaissance that it came from. This arch was a remnant of the Museum of French Monuments erected in the courtyard by Lenoir. In Debray's first project, the arch was scheduled for demolition like all the rest, but Dubon, struck by its beauty, decided to make it the heart of his composition, seizing this miraculous opportunity to work with the past. He even added an extra floor to the palace in order to make it visible from the street. To do this, he had to wage a virtual war against the opinion of the Civil Buildings Council that scorned French art and wholeheartedly rejected this arch that didn't belong to the canons of the Academy. Dubon threatened to resign and explained, An admirable example of grace and delicacy happens by the most happy of coincidences to be in the most favorable position, in line with the building that the government has designated for the study of architecture. The different functions of the school's buildings require a gate, according to the council. Well, this gate exists in stone and is a masterpiece of a bygone era. It exists there in the fine arts school on the very spot where the government would need to raise it if it weren't already there.
And while defending the French Renaissance, Dubon continued to refer to the poetry of Rome by blending constructions from different periods and creating a vision of history. Dubon won his struggle, but lost it a century and a half later. In 1977, thanks to the removal of a temporary prefabricated building that had stood on the spot for seven years, the Arc de Gaillon, claimed by Ur Department Council, was dismantled and returned to Gaillon without a prior archaeological survey. The chateau destroyed during the revolution could not be reconstructed, and the arch is now a dual orphan, both of its chateau and of the school that adopted it and gave it the best possible setting. The chateau at Annay, built by Philibert Delorme, has also suffered from revolutionary vandalism. Nothing remained of the main body of the chateau. or almost. The main doorway, saved by Lenoir, had ended up in Paris, stuck on the facade of the Petit Augustin Church. Dubon also gave it a place in his general composition of the courtyards. He lined the cloister arcades up at the same height of the Annette doorway at first, before realigning them at the height of the Arc de Gaillon once he had obtained its preservation. With a typically classic concern for symmetry around a central axis, he decorated the opposite wall with the same arcades. And in these arcades, Dubon placed architectural fragments in order to create a sort of open-air museum. In this way, Dubon continued Lenoir's work by setting the fragments out in chronological order. It was an ideal opportunity for him to provide educational examples within these walls, to show students that the history of architecture wasn't confined to antiquity and the Italian Renaissance. Dubon dreamt of finding a fragment of a Gothic church to be the counterpart of the Annet Gateway opposite. But he would never find it, and the cornice raised to support it would remain empty. By including fragments of the French Renaissance in his school imbued with classical and modern Italy, Dubon built an ideal realm, a romantic dream fueled by the idea that modern art is the product of the evolution of the past, and in itself is neither complete nor final, but merely a piece added in its own time. The school's plan is designed as a lesson in history where time is replaced by progress through space. Crossing this area is tantamount to experiencing a portion of history. At the same time, a description of the student's journey toward fame is outlined here, a sort of via sacra. At the end of this itinerary lies the semicircular hall where prizes are awarded and where the winners of the grand prize receive the crown of laurels reserved for the triumphant. In this room, Dubon commissioned Delaroche to paint a vast fresco that repeats this ideal vision of a dialogue between artists down through the ages. Painters, sculptors, and architects from every period and country are shown as a large brotherhood defying time. In the Daily Studies building, Dubon provided another demonstration. Dubon wanted to communicate his passion for the bright colors of southern Italy, with which he had filled whole sketchbooks in his youth.
he turned the cloister court, known as the Mulberry Court, into a Pompeian atrium. Rather than the students' works that the teachers wished to display in the arcades, Dubon preferred scale copies of ancient masterpieces, explaining that the students, even during rest periods, had to have the best examples of the art of past centuries before their eyes. The main stage of the school's construction was completed in 1842. But there were more and more students, and the teachers demanded additional space to exhibit their work. Therefore, the state acquired a plot of land on the Quai Malaquais. Dubon built a passageway from the Mulberry Court and designed a new building on the river that would be completed in 1861. Thirty years apart, Dubon created two totally different buildings. The new building was resolutely modern with a virtually industrial facade that came in for a great deal of criticism. Dubon was reproached for the monumental nature of the building that stands out too clearly from the neighboring facades with its vast picture windows designed to provide light for the exhibition room. People expressed surprise at the large oculi that are in fact a direct reference to the Louvre across the Seine. The sculpted elements, which Dubon obstinately continued to refer to as art through the ages, were considered out of all proportion. Times had changed. Dubon was no longer the royal favorite. Napoleon III preferred Visconti and Violette le Duc. Dubon died in 1870, bitter at having only ever done restoration work, however prestigious. The fine arts school was the darling child that he spent his life looking after. The editor of the 19th century's leading architecture periodical, César Dali, wrote, Alas, the true monument to his magnificent work cannot be sought out in the light of day, but in the souls of the current generation of architects. Indeed, Dubon's school would mark a style of architecture, the Beaux-Arts style, that would have a considerable influence on generations of architect in Europe, Africa, and even America. After Dubon's death, the school would buy more land, an 18th century private residence, and build new buildings after the Second World War. These buildings would mark the arrival en masse of the studios that the school had lacked until then. Today, Dubon's truncated work is no longer legible. Most people know nothing of this story that was modern for its time and for which the 20th century visitor has lost all bearings. The school seems like a district of the city left to its own devices, with its anarchistic and unforeseeable expansion, where each group defends its own territory. Studios, administrative offices, and collections cohabit and ignore each other in the buildings of this realm created in spite of itself. The buildings seem to be squatted by their occupiers, who take them over in a bodily struggle that is never indifferent and often destructive. Like the ruins mistreated by the inhabitants of Rome, time has caught up with Dubon's school, and what remains of it today recall the words of Victor Hugo. Time is the architect, the people are the masons.